Hello and welcome to another instalment of History Hack. Alina, who's on to talk to us today? We've got with us Heather Dune McAdam, uh, who's a journalist, historian and author, who has published many books like The Weeping Buddha, Re- Rena's Promise, and her most recent publication, 999, The Extraordinary Young Woman of the First Official Transport to Auschwitz. Welcome, Heather. Thank you. Glad to be here. I think, firstly, we have to ask you, what inspired you to write this very powerful and interesting book? Well, it's my second foray into the Holocaust, and actually right now I'm working on my third. Um, so, you know, I, I met a survivor of the first transport back in the early 90s, and the first book I wrote, I wrote with her as a memoir, um, and that was Rena's Promise. And at the time, you know, this was before the internet and everything, I, you know, I thought that was it. I didn't, couldn't imagine anybody had survived over three years in Auschwitz um, like Rena and her sister had. And um, we did find one survivor who lived in Cleveland, um, but that was really it. And and then I was in um, Slovakia <laughs> in 2012. I went, <clears throat> it's sort of an honor of Rina, actually definitely an honor of Rina, on like a pilgrimage from Slovakia to Auschwitz. And Slovakia was where the very first Jewish transport left. And it was full of 999 young women. And what I discovered while I was there was another survivor whose name is Edith Grossman. And I discovered um, historians and a lot more information that I didn't know. And I discovered families of girls who had died who were on that transport. So it became this, um, you know, originally I thought I was going to do a documentary Uh, and then sort of in the midst of filming and gathering this research, my husband actually said, you've got to write a book too. And um, I went to Edith Grossman, who I was working with, and as my sort of lead story, and I said, you know, Edith, I don't think I want to write a memoir again, like I had for Rena. I want to do a book about all of you. And she said, you should, definitely. We were all there, and, um, and, you know, Edith, Um, Edith had gone on that transport with many of her friends. So she could look at, um, I found this historic list in in Yad Vashem of all the girls' names, which took me quite a while to unearth and discover. And um, and Edith could look at those names and go, oh, she didn't survive. Oh, she survived. Uh, You know, she just was this goldmine of information. And through that work, I started to discover other survivors and um, and I filmed them and I wrote about them. And that's, it, you know, started out as a small project and it's become enormous. <laughs> Can you tell us what life was like for these women before the decision was made to send them to Auschwitz? Mm. Well, they were, it was, you know, it started, part of the whole story is the um, betrayal of these young girls. First of all, some of them are 15. They were supposed to be 16 to 32. Um, one of the girls actually had her... Um, 16th birthday on the day she was deported and she's alive today she lives in Australia and um you know they were a lot of them were in school right well not at that point because um Jews were no longer allowed education at that point but you know the these were teenagers many 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 teenagers so you know they were kids they were just mm-hmm. kids Um, Then you had young women who may have been working professionally. I I know of one um, who was a corset maker. She made girdles and bras. Um, Some were secretaries. Um, You know, they were just young women. And the betrayal of this is that the Slovak government said that they needed to sign up for work. And they were going and they were going to do three months of government service and everybody thought they were going to be going to a shoe factory because Slovakia at the time was the largest manufacturer of um, boots, war army boots. And so everybody thought that that's where they were going to go. And, uh, and they ended up in Auschwitz and that was the plan. So these girls voluntarily turned up. I mean, you know, some of them more voluntarily than others. Some tried to hide and they were caught and arrested by police um, or yeah, well, not formally arrested, but um, dragged off. <laughs> and, um, and, and so they had no idea, no idea. And parents, uh, the, the girls were actually told that um, they were going to be getting, sending money home. Yeah. <sighs> oh, it just, Awful. how, 
how do it, how did they get to these 999 why is it these girls what was the selection process or well, is it just it, a random this is who they rounded up um you know prior to this um the the jews had been having to register and so every town had uh, somebody who was in charge of jewish registration that was normally a, a jewish um, person and who was head of the registrations and so the very original um there's a list that edith had that it has her address in it um and she and her sister um you know so you you can go down this list um i have i've only seen that page of it Hmm. but um and there's a little check by it which means that they they turned they had to go to a school in the town uh, edith lived in humana slovakia which is very near the hungarian border and and you can see the check. So every town had these th- this these kinds of lists that were created by the police, the local police, and um, you know. Th- so that's how it started. And then of course, uh, when they arrived, they were concentrated in a old army barrack in a town called Poprad, um, which is very um, very near the Carpathian Mountains, and they um, they that that list was typed up and that was 999 girls well there's a debate about the number um who arrived at auschwitz isn't there why why is it so debatable well it's it's very interesting first of all there's typos on the on the list so there's actually 997 girls um and it was a very big uh all of the survivors i'd met um before i found the list said that um, they kept counting them over when they got to Auschwitz, they kept counting them over and over and over and over again. They couldn't figure out what was wrong. And finally, somebody must have looked at the list and seen the typos. And so there's actually 997. But the reason I use the word, the, you know, 999 is uh, because um, Heinrich Himmler, who was the head of the SS, was very involved in astrology and numerology. And he selected 999 um female prisoners from Ravensbrück, and these are Aryan um, female prisoners, and they were to be <clears throat> the kapos or in charge of the, the female Jewish prisoners. At that point, Auschwitz had no women at all. And, um, and the fact that there was 999 of those kapos that ca- arrived on the same day as these 999 girls, um, I smelled a rat. <laughs> Mm. Um, because I knew, um, I, I knew enough about Himmler to not think anything he was doing was an accident. So I actually asked somebody who's a historic astrologer, um, to take a look at, um, the number and the date. And he did this amazing, it's so complex that I can barely wrap my head around it. But, you know, the, um, the third Reich was full of a cult and mysticism they actually had a department for to um for the nostradamus prophecies you know people were supposed to analyze those and um and when you look at the dates the actual date of the transport there's like a there's something going on i forget um it's i have it in the book all unpacked (laughs) but it's it's like um there's an eclipse and it has to do with himmler's birth date and the date that they decide on the jewish solution and it's and you just and then the number 999 that means the end of something the next it's the last single digit right before you move into 10. And so when you want to finalize and end something that in, in occultism, that's the number you use. He wanted to end. So creepy. Horrible, isn't it? Yeah. It just, it's just creepy enough to be true, right? Yeah. Well, it's Himmler. So yeah, but we also, we have people today that are QAnons and they believe, they believe. Do you know what? Virus. I looked that up. I had heard it and heard it and heard it. And we discussed it briefly on a show on here, but it like a jokey show that we do down the pub. Right. And I thought Charlie was exaggerating about what it was. It's not. They, these people are morons. Yeah, but they don't. It, and you think, you think the same thing about Nazis, right? Yeah, like, I mean, I make a, they believe and you think I well, make a show called World War Weird, where I basically get paid to laugh at the Nazis. It's, it's, I've got some great responses from pro Nazi people who say I don't respect their achievements. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> let's not respect them. 
Uh, let's talk about these women and their journey. What did it look like, the journey to Auschwitz? I just, it breaks my heart that these young girls were probably excited about going to earn money and send it back to their families. And they were. Like they, sang, they sang the Slovak national anthem on the way to Auschwitz. Oh, God. They're babies. One, one of the girls, actually, when they're taking all their they're taking all their jewelry and everything and they're, they're stripping and they're, you know, they're about to pro they're about to shave them of all their hair. She says, um, she literally hands her jewelry over and she turns to her friend and she says, we'll be able to, we'll be able to buy, um, new jewelry from our, from, from our jobs. They're so innocent. They have no idea. Um, and the journey is, um, you know, the journey is one of those things that when you talk, um, when you talk with uh, survivors of trauma, right, um, you have to be really careful not to re-traumatize them. And the thing about this train journey is there's very little to remember because it's at night and they are mostly in shock. Um, what they remember, mo you know, sort of generally, they remember being cold. They remember going into the pole. Uh, they remember the train the transport being handed over to the Germans at the Polish border. And um, which of course with greater Germany at that point, but there's not a lot that, um, that they remember. And um, because it is, uh, they're in such shock um, from what has, is happening to, to them. But one of my survivors who I just filmed um, for the documentary, the one who's in Australia, she said the most, she didn't know anybody on the train um, in her cattle car. And um, whereas um, Edith knew, you know, just about everybody in the cattle car, because all the friends, everybody stayed together. If you knew somebody, mm. you formed a clique, right? But- um, As but a teenage girls, that doesn't change. No, right, exactly. <laughs> And, um, and Elizabeth didn't know anybody because she had been away at a private school. And, and so, um, so when she was taken, she was actually raised Catholic. So she didn't even really know she was, she didn't, Jewish was not something she really connected to. And, um, and she remembers just sitting there alone, um, you know, huddled in a corner. And it's so powerful. I mean, she's 97 today. And to hear her talk about this, um, you know, her face, um, she looks like a young girl when she speaks about it. And it was her birthday. It was her 60th oh, birthday. God. I know. She remembers peering out the window, seeing her father outside, trying to see her, and he can't see her. Yeah. And that's, of course, the last time she sees him. Mm. So these girls arrived Auschwitz on the 26th of March on 1942. What happened when they arrived? Um, well, the, it's, um, it's processing and it's a typical processing that they did with women in Robinsbrook. So they're, it's strip searched. Um, they actually did gynecological exams on the first 100. And then they realized, of course, that, you know, these are not the kind of girls that are going to hide things up their vaginas. Um, and they were all virgins. And so, um, but for many of them, you know, that was their loss of virginity. And um, there's a very powerful <clears throat> um, Joan Rosner, uh, Joan Re Weintraub, um, her married name. She says, you know, for years I was embarrassed about what had happened to me. And then she said, and then she goes, but I'm an old lady now. And I realize <laughs> it doesn't, you know, they did it. It wasn't me. Um, but, you know, the shame of that, I mean, these are orthodox, very, very religious, very innocent young women um, to be violated like that. Um, it's really horrifying. Um, it, they, uh, they're strip searched, they're, then they're um, shaved, they're shaved by men. Um, one of the girls, uh, Adela Gross, whose family I'm very close with, um, and Adela does not survive, and she's sort of um, the reason I got back involved in the story, um, which I won't go into right now, but Adela had incredible thick red hair, mm. and, um, and one of her friends remembers the uh, SS checking her hair to see if there was anything in them, like nail files, and right before they shave her. And, um, yeah, so just, they were humiliated, right? And, um, 
it's um i'm just the book i'm working on right now is about the first uh transport of jews from france female mm. um women uh to Auschwitz from France, and that's the third French convoy. But one of the one of the um, one of the um, testimonies says that um, Rudolf Hess, who was the commandant of Auschwitz, came to watch the French his first French Jews, the female, um, came to watch them be strip searched, so he could delight. And seeing, you know, the sexy French Jews be humiliated, and he made fun of those who had red varnish on their toes. Oh, just just defies belief, doesn't it? it How, what? So these girls have arrived. They've been processed. What does life look like in the main camp? Well, it it, it for, um, you know, this is what's so unique about this story is that. Um, they're just figuring stuff out, right? The uh, nothing's organized. This is not um, this is not Auschwitz. Uh, six months later, um, everything is the first time. Everything is really unorganized. Um, they don't work immediately. Uh, they get they get tattooed. Um, they're given their numbers. They have to sew the numbers onto. They're they're forced to wear Russian uniforms, and men's Russian uniforms. Um, and these are um, against the Geneva Convention. These are prisoners who've been executed <clears throat> um, when uh, Germany uh, invaded Poland. So there's it's, uh, up to this point, Paul, uh, Auschwitz had been mostly a POW camp. There were some Jews in it, but they were mostly intellectuals. They hadn't been arrested for being Jews. Uh, most of them were probably dead by this point anyway. But they were working in the kitchen and they were POWs and they were executing the Russian POWs. And... <clears throat> And they gave the girls their uh, filthy woolen um, uh, uniforms to wear, uh, which had bullet holes in them and covered in blood and feces. And you have to remember, these girls are really small, you know? I mean, I'm like almost 5'9". Mm. I could wear men's clothes. But, you know, this is 1942. Most of these women are five foot or shorter, right? Mm. I mean, tall is maybe five foot four. That's tall. And, um, and one of the women says she puts on this man's blouse and it goes to her ankles. I mean, this is what they're forced to wear. They can't keep their pants up. They can't, there's no underwear. Um, so that's one of the ways that they shame them. And, and then they're given these, um, they call them clappers. And they're, they're sort of like Birkenstocks with one, er, um, not Birkenstocks, uh, Dr. Scholl, you know, like that one strap on a flat piece of wood but there's no arch support or anything they're not comfortable mm. and they don't fit because men made them so they're this they're the size of men's feet and this is they have to march out to work and some of the jobs that they do um, one of them is spreading manure in the fields and this is march so it's cold sometimes there's snow um and uh and it's frozen and uh and if you lose your shoe uh you know you're they'll shoot you. Um, so that's one of the jobs. Edith and her sister, um, whose, whose name was Leah, uh, Edith, they, cl- they're told to clean the roads and the, um, the camp roads inside of Auschwitz camp. And so I, you know, when she first told me that I said, Oh, you know, so you were sweeping snow. And she said, no, <laughs> we had to use our hands to move snow off the road. They didn't have shovels. They wouldn't give them any tools. So all of this work they had to do was with their bare hands. And then they had them demolition buildings. So these are young women who are told to push over buildings because they're trying to create, their, make the camp larger. They've taken over Polish homes. They're dismantling them. They're taking the bricks to build Birkenau, which is Birkenau doesn't exist yet, really. Um, there's some wood shacks over there, but no no brick um, barracks or blocks. So yeah, so this is like imagine being 16 years old and and having to you know push a building over or uh, you know throw roofing tiles down. I mean th- this is hard labor. This is labor for men, mm-hmm. right? What was the difference between the first and second transports? Because there's another one that comes along, doesn't? Yeah, there? yeah. They can't. They start. They 
um, this is right around Passover, you know, there's virtually no difference except, um, and Edith feels there's quite a big difference, except that the first transport, there was nobody there to give them any advice, nothing. And when the second transport arrives two days later, they are able to say to the girls, do this, do that, right? And try to help them. Mm. And, um, and, you know, Edith makes this very poignant um, statement about, um, you know, watching the more transports come in. She said, you know, um, when we were already done being afraid, we had already been, we were, we were used to being hungry. We were used to being afraid. So when the other transports start to come in, um, you know, they're dealing with, with the terror and the hunger and, and those who have gotten over that bit, you know, you just, you, at some point, you know, you realize that you're just going to be afraid all the time and you just get on with it. You're not going to, you're never going to be full. You're just always going to be hungry and your body starts to adjust to that as well as your, your, um, your psychological well being if you, if you're able to do that. And some people can't. So you mentioned that poor girl's father looking for her on the train. There is no shoe factory. There are no wages coming back. They're presumably hearing nothing from their daughters. What is the reaction from the families at home? Well, they don't have a lot to react because by that, you know, within two months, um, Slovakia makes it, it, this is the other thing legally, it was illegal to deport Jews. So there was a big outcry in April of 1942 saying, you can't take our children. Um, They had started to take um, young men at that point. And so they stopped uh, for a couple of weeks. And then the legislature, the assembly passed a law saying it was legal to deport Jews. And then they just started to deport everybody. And um, President Tiso, who was a fascist and a priest, um, he was in charge of the Slovak, uh, so I won't say republic, (laughs) the Slovak fascist government. Um, He told everybody, you know, oh, well, we've heard you. So we're going to let you all be deported together. Yeah. Okay, that's not really a solution, is it? Yeah, well, it's a solution if you want to kill everybody. Yeah. What What did they do? Do, you, do we know what the families did when they didn't hear from their daughters? Or, um, Well, um, Edith's father, mm. um, he actually had, uh, he had a special position. So if you... If you were a Jew and you were doing something that the government could use you for, um, you were in less danger of being deported, at least not initially, because they still needed you. And her father, um, he fixed um, uh, planes, so war planes. He fixed the windows on them. And so he had an important position, and he actually sent somebody to Auschwitz to try and rescue his daughters. Um, uh, and the man returned and said, uh, your daughters aren't there. There's only crazy people. You have to remember that, you know, you, you can't recognize them because they have no hair. They're dressed in men's clothing. They're starving. Um, you know, it's, they they, they don't look like, um, young women, do they? So, um, but most of the people, you know, are they some of them probably tried to write letters, but most of them get deported and, and end up in Auschwitz um, or Lu, uh, you know Lublin or you know any of the other camps, and they are all going to die. So there's a very short window of time to do anything before you're going to be deported and sent to the gas. So women have then moved to Birkenau in the first half of August '42. So what's life like there in the camp? Are the conditions any better than the main camp? What, much, much worse, much worse. And, and um, this is the thing about Birkenau. It, first of all, it's a swamp. Um, and so in the summer, it is hard clay, um, super hot. There's no vegetation whatsoever. There's no trees. If you've ever been there, it is um, truly, truly overwhelming. It is so enormous <clears throat> and so... Um, empty and uh super cold or super hot the there's always um a wind 
uh, in the winter, especially. So the, um, and when it's not super hot and hard, hard clay, it is mud. And, um, and so you have that issue with these horrible, um, you know, clappers, these horrible sandals that you're wearing. Um, so you can end up getting your feet, your, your feet can get rotten. Mm. Um, you can get gangrene. I mean, you can get frostbite and then gangrene in the winters. Getting good shoes is really important to survival. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is there's a huge typhus epidemic. So um, the typhus epidemic is starting in Auschwitz and, um, and typhus, you know, like, uh, unlike COVID, um, is uh, not passed from uh, human to human, but it is passed through lice. Mm -hmm. um, there's three kinds. There's the, the type that comes from rats, the type that comes from lice, and the type that comes from fleas. And of course, lice and fleas are going <clears> to <throat> move from human to human. So it spreads like wildfire. And, um, and even SS are dying of typhus. So <clears throat> when the girls move to Birkenau, um, it, they start the selections. And that's the first selections of prisoners um, to, to going to the gas chamber start around August 15th, 1942. Prior to that, there are no selections of um, prisoners. <clears throat> the, uh, they do not start. The other important thing here is that you know, when you arrived in Auschwitz prior to July 4th, 1942, you were taken right into the camp. They didn't select, um, they didn't say, you're going to go to the gas, you're going to go to work. They didn't start that until July 4th, 1942. So, um, but Birkenau is just everybody, uh, I know Edith says, you know, Birkenau was when the death camp truly began. And um, within weeks of arriving there, um, you know, thousands of women die. What sort of commandos did the women work in? What were they expected to do once they were in Birkenhell? Was some more favourable, I use that word extremely well, grudgingly, than others? Yeah, they, so we had the same commandos, the manure spreading. Um, <clears throat> one of the, there's a punishment uh, commando it ends up becoming a punishment commando, but it was one, it was the road, the road clearing one also was swamp clearing. So you'd have to go into the water, into the ditches and into ponds and clear out uh, garbage. And Edith and her sister were stuck in that one because they were road clearers. And that is super, super, your health is really at risk because you're cold and wet all the time. Um, and that's probably why uh, both she and her sister end up getting ill. Um, Edith survives and her sister does not. Um, but there are other details. So um, one, of, one of our first transports, she ends up working in the Lycan Commando, which is collecting the dead bodies. Um, and she does that willingly because she gets extra bread. And she knows that she doesn't have to do hard labor outside. And she, is, she knows enough about herself at 16 years old to know that she won't survive because she's always cold. She probably has low blood pressure. And she just can never stay warm. So she wants to work inside. Some of the better jobs were working in the office. If you had office skills, um, if you spoke other languages, you might get a better job. <clears throat> one of our survivors, excuse me, one of our survivors um, has very neat handwriting and had been a secretary um, it, when she was in, you know, before she came to Auschwitz. And she was taken by Dr. Mengele to be his scribe. Oh. So she wrote down the numbers of the women that were selected. Um, and, uh, and she's actually was responsible for saving one of Edith's um, best friends. Um, so there's all of these little, it's one of the things I sort of loved about doing this research because um, when I started to go through the testimonies, I would go, oh, wait a minute. Like they don't all know each other's names, right? <clears throat> but you get two people talking about something and then you know that this person over here, so Ella, who does, writes the text, who does the numbers, the only way that this one woman can get out of block 25, which is where the sick people are, and the only way out is to die. The only way she can get out is if somebody changes the number. 
And, and so I have a witness who says um, that they changed the number to a dead body and she walked out holding the stretcher with them. Well, the only person who could have changed that number was Ella. Mm. And the person holding the stretcher is the girl from the Lycan Commando. And, and so it's like, and that's, one of I, and that's one of Edith's best friends. And so that woman ends up saving Edith's life on the death march. It's all, it's like this big tapestry of sisterhood, mm. right? And solidarity and, and, you know, you do, you recognize people, you go, oh, I came with you on the first transport. I may not know you from home. I may not know you from any other place, um, but I recognize you. So I'm going to try and help you because helping people is super important and super difficult, right? And anytime you help somebody, you're risking your life. So you really have to care to risk your life. I'm curious to know, do conditions ever improve? No. <laughs> they they get just worse. get progressively worse the more people that get sent yeah. there. Yeah, they get, it, yeah, um, by, the, by 1944. Um, by 1944, all of the women who are going to survive from the first transport are in better positions. So they may be in uh, what was called Canada, sorting clothes. That was one of the best jobs um, uh, in that you got, um, you didn't have to wear a uniform, you could grow your hair out, you got a little extra bread, but you could be, um, you know, you could be murdered at the drop of a hat. And one of the hardest things about working in, in that detail was you were right outside the gas chambers. So you watched thousands of Hungarian Jews in 1944 heading to the gas. And in, in the fall, you saw, uh, you saw your own family and friends heading to the gas and there was nothing you could do. So it was a real um, psychological uh, uh, traumatic job. And um, so, yeah, every, you know, every good job had, um, had its shadow side that um, you had to cope with if you were working it. How many women from your group from this transport survived the concentration camp system? And it's a really horrible question to put an exact it, it number is. on it. But. I, but no, but people, are, everybody asks that, and, and we don't know. Um, one of the reasons we don't know is that they, um, you know, they dispersed at the end of the war. Not everybody went to Slovakia. And so um, the historian that I've worked with in Slovakia thought that only 20 had survived because about 20 came back to Slovakia. Mm. And, well, about 20 came back to Slovakia or were had been in Slovakia or thereabouts um, when he was doing his research, right? Which was probably in the eighties and nineties. And so, um, but by that point, many had left Slovakia where there's a large group in uh, Melbourne, Australia. There are women in uh, Montreal and, Ca and Toronto, Canada. And then there's our American contingents. And then there's, um, I actually found a survivor down in Argentina. So, um, you know, many of them didn't go home because they didn't have a home to go to. They knew from being in Auschwitz that um, they had no parents left. Um, Joan Weintraub, um, actually, you know, she had an aunt who was in, I think she was in Chicago. And when she was uh, freed, she wrote, she wrote to America and her aunt immediately, you know, um, sent her money to come to America. So she never went back to Slovakia. So, um, so that's one of the reasons we do not have accurate records. The other, the other, um, you know, you could, and I, this has happened a few times. I find out that somebody survives all of it, right? They survive mm. three years in Auschwitz, the death march, and then they're liberated and she eats too much and she dies of, um, uh, because her stomach can handle it. Oh God. And um, so I, it's the nearest I can guess is that there were about 200 that survived. Um, and, and that's sort of, I know of, right now, I know of about 60. So I'm, I, you know, I'm sort of expanding what I know mm. and then who I was able to interview because I didn't do the work until the past, you know, five or six years and many of those women have died. Mm. Um, and I have testimony um, from the Shoah Foundation, et cetera. But, um, but a lot of women didn't speak about it. And one of the reasons was that they had better positions. They may have been block elders. Um, they, they may, 
you know, they may just want to keep it secret. And I do know a couple of uh, women who were in my first book and in the second book. And, um, and they, you know, they never spoke about it to their families. So there's no way we would know. Um, except that I do know because I know their families. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how many of those women? So I would guess, um, you know, I, I, I don't know if that is a high number or a low number. It's as good as you can get. It's it's just, I'm, I'm sort of, because um, I know that the one thing about being on the first transport is you did get a little extra respect in the end from the SS. So um, Drexler, the, the, uh, one of the SS women, actually um, in 1943, in the beginning of 1943, said that anybody with a um, four-digit number um, and with the number one in front of it was excused from selection. So they would go through and they would look. They do this to, my, to, to Rena, the woman I wrote about in my first mm. book. They go, oh, look. They point, look, she was on the first transport. And they let her go by. Wow. Um, so it's almost like, a, oh, let's see, you know, let's see how much longer she can survive, right? It's not that they care. Yeah. It's more like a fluke. Oh, we didn't kill this one yet. Let's see how much longer she can go. Heather, thank you so much for coming on to talk to us about the 999 women and give us a bit of an overview. Uh, the book is quite big. It's full of stories like this and full of the testimony that you've got together. Um, really hear about these women in their own words so tell everybody again what it's called and where they can get hold of it yeah well um it's uh in england it's the 900 the extraordinary young women of the first official jewish transport to auschwitz and we use that sort of long term because himmler ordered the transport Mm -hmm. um and in america it is 999 so um yeah and it's coming out in paperback i think this week it is indeed thank you so much for joining us so much stay safe and healthy everybody you too thank you cheers Join us tomorrow when we will be talking all things shopping in ancient Rome. Claire Holleran has given us a brilliant expose into the sights, the sounds and the shops we might have found wandering the ancient streets. So don't miss out on that one. Don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Alina and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, uh, but life's going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join... There's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms. We're revamping ourselves on both of them. So don't forget to go in. You can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up History Hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year. We are now on YouTube. We are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms. So you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time. So do go over there and subscribe.